No Telescope event. Um, normally we'd be welcoming you uh, to the department, uh, getting you seated, sitting down. Uh, we'd be showing you some of our telescopes and giving you some free tea and coffee. Uh, however, obviously, you know, with, with the current situation going on worldwide, that's not something we can do. Um, but we are fortunate in the fact that what we can do is uh, we can still bring you the talk aspect and obviously you can still uh, have refreshments at your own leisure. So we are very, very pleased um, to welcome uh, Dr. Meyer uh, to come and talk to us today uh, about chemistry in space. This is not a topic that we touch on particularly often. Uh, obviously in, in physics and astrophysics, we, we very rarely touch on chemistry, uh, but we also don't really mention this much as AstroSoc either. Uh, and perhaps it really is something that we should be talking about a lot more often. After all, space is uh, incredibly interdisciplinary, uh, featuring a, a broad spectrum of, of the sciences. Um, and so hopefully uh, we'll hear a lot more about this and help broaden our knowledge uh, this evening. Uh, Dr. Meyer, over to you. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Um, so my name is Anthony Meyer. I'm a professor of theoretical chemistry at the University of Sheffield. And one of the areas in which I'm interested is astrochemistry. So uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll start chemistry in space. Right. OK, let me just make sure my pointer is. So let me just quickly start with the definition of astrochemistry. So in the, in the, in the pre-talk, in the, in the green room, if you wish, we talked about the, the interdisciplinary nature of astronomy. And astrochemistry really is about the most interdisciplinary subject you can find. It is the study of chemistry in space, and it really lies on that boundary between chemistry, physics, astronomy, cosmology, comes some, to some extent into it as well, and of course biology as well, and I will say something about that right at the end. Um, it's also very interesting for me as a theoretician because there's a really strong collaborative uh, aspect to it. Uh, I'm always uh, uh, talking to experimental colleagues, not necessarily at the University of Sheffield, but around the world. And of course, with astronomers, because they do the observations that we ultimately rely on uh, to, uh, to, to make our, uh, our predictions. Right, okay, so because this is a, a non-chemistry audience, uh, please allow me um, just a, a quick, detour or, or, or sidestep on, on, on Earth chemistry. So what does chemistry here on Earth actually look like? Well, if I do this with a really broad brush, then I would say there are three types of reaction. And there are reactions that cost energy, uh, that might require either an initial investment of energy or might continue a continuous investment of energy, and reactions that don't cost energy. And so, um, if I talk about something that requires an invest, initial investment of energy in an explosion, for example, or any type of burning um, uh, of fuel, it falls under that particular category. Um, and you can see that, for instance, if you think about the space shuttle, I mean, it, it had hydrazine and, and liquid oxygen as, as the fuel and the, uh, and the oxygen, and they would sit happily side by side until you spark them off and you got lift off. If you think about reactions that require a constant um, uh, energy input, then photosynthesis uh, would be one of those. Um, it is a constant input of energy. And of course, you get some oxygen and, 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 and sugars out. And then when you burn that, you get that energy back again. Reactions that are, don't require any energy input. Well, rusting is an obvious one for anybody who's ever left their bike outside in the rain. Uh, it just happens automatically. I'm not entirely sure how big the screen is that you can see, but it says here, um, uh, rust in peace, A. Austin, born in the 1930s, died in the 1950s of metal cancer. Uh, this was an image taken in uh, a small town called Pilgrim's Rest in South Africa. Okay, so the take home message here is that chemistry on Earth is an interplay between kinetics, how fast something goes, and thermodynamics, in other words, how stable something is. And we'll see, uh, let me just give you a, um, a spoiler. Uh, the same thing happens in space as well. And you can control the chemistry on Earth by temperature. If it's an endothermic reaction, then you require heat input, so you can control how fast the reaction is going by varying the amount of heat you put into the reaction. Um, if a reaction gives off heat, it's exothermic, then you can cool it uh, to make it go slower, for example. Um, you can change the concentration, so you can 
uh, uh, increase the concentration in a vessel, you can change the pressure, and that allows you to direct the reactivity as well. And mainly what you're directing in that case is the fact that you have many more collisions because it's collisions that give you the chemistry uh, uh, anywhere, really. And the final thing that you can control here on Earth is the composition. If you change the kind of molecules, the kind of molecules that go in, you can determine, uh, you can change what comes out. I mean, that's the whole basis of anything that any of my organic colleagues do. The key thing is that in the lab, you can control that to a very high degree. So what about chemistry in space? Well, let's think about the first thing first. So I said composition is important. So if we take a lab, this is uh, uh, an image of, of a, a random cupboard, a chemicals cupboard for one of my colleagues. Um, and essentially, if they can't make it themselves, they buy it. That's, that's basically how it goes. Um, and you can basically get anything uh, for, from, from, from companies like Sigma Ulrich, for example. So you have a very high degree of control over the composition of the reaction that you try to do. But now if you start thinking about chemistries in the wild, if, if you wish, then it really depends on where you do it. So um, this is a periodic table, everybody will recognize it. And what I've done here is um, a, um, a log scale. So what is red is about eight orders of magnitude more abundant than whatever is blue on this scale. And you can see that in the Earth's crust, we have uh, magnesium, sodium, calcium, potassium as the cations. We have iron, uh, silicon, aluminium, oxygen. Uh, so we have silicates, uh, iron, magnetosilicates. Those are the main components of the Earth's crust. Um, OK, let's look somewhere else. Uh, let's look at the ocean. Well, in the next case, we have, of course, oxygen for water. We have hydrogen for water as well. And we have sodium and we have chlorine for sodium chloride. So again, uh, the chemistry will be uh, controlled by the kind of elements that go in. Right, let's look at the universe. Well, the universe, in terms of its composition, is really rather boring. Uh, we have hydrogen, we have helium, and that's pretty much it. Everything else is, tra is a trace element. Uh, next uh, most abundant is actually oxygen, then we have carbon, there's a bit of nitrogen there, and then some more random elements down here. So the kind of chemistry that you would expect to get would be dominated by hydrogen. Helium, well, helium is massively unreactive, so that's not going to be really uh, uh, be very important, is carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And so for the kind of molecules that you would find tend to be dominated in carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. As a complete and utter aside, uh, what is really interesting about this image is if you look down here, for example, so samarium, europium, gadolinium, terbium, dysprosium, you see that um, samarium and gadolinium are much more abundant than terbium and europium. That has to do with the way the elements form in stars. Um, the early elements are largely formed through alpha capture, so where the uh, uh, proton number goes up by two. So if you start off with something which is even, the next one will be even as well and even and so on. And so you see um, a, a very strong odd even asymmetry in the periodic table, which comes straight from the way they form inside stars. Okay, so where do we form uh, elements? Okay, uh, this is for astronomers, this should be old hat. Uh, you know, in our sun, we burn hydrogen to form helium. Um, uh, if we want to get carbon and oxygen, you need more heavy element, uh, heavy stars. So for instance, uh, Sirius, that definitely would, would uh, do the triple alpha process and give you carbon and later oxygen. Um, actually, I like this picture because Sirius, of course, at this time of the year really starts to become visible again because Orion becomes a, a visible constellation. It's a bit early, later in the winter, it's actually really, really um, visible very early on. If you want to go further than that, then uh, you need much more heavy stars. So Betelgeuse is a red supergiant and Rigel, uh, a blue supergiant, where you get up to iron. Um, as, again, as an aside, um, all of these actually featured in films or TV programs. Beetlejuice, there was a film on that with Tim Burton in the 1980s, I remember that. Of course, Bellatrix for Strange was in Harry Potter, and Rigel, for some of you, uh, might have seen a late 90s uh, a TV series called Farscape, and there was a character called Rigel in there. So uh, writers definitely looked at the heavens for inspiration uh, uh, to, for their characters. If you want to go beyond iron, then you really need supernovas, supernovae. 
uh, and this is a, a pretty nice example the crab nebula um, uh, again interestingly this was uh, in the 19 uh, did I just freeze I can see myself anymore I think everything is working, by the way. Everything is working, right? Okay, let's let's go on because I seem to have frozen here. Uh, yes, I seem to have frozen. I'm going to have to stop this and actually start from this point. I'm not so sure why that happened I, because I can't move my screen. Ah, technical problems. Okay, well, it's just uh, everything's just gone very slow. YouTube, I can see that you're, I can see that everything's working smoothly. Right, okay, because I can only see myself here, uh, because I can't see myself moving forwards with the mouse. That's really frustrating. Yeah, it does appear that the mouse has frozen. Yeah, perhaps maybe if, if you could maybe stop sharing your screen and then restart sharing again. Yes, I'm afraid I'm going to have to... Ah! That's here. I was afraid uh, that might happen. These things are, to some extent, an exercise in terror. <laughs> ah. Right, I'm going to have to stop sharing this and see whether I can restart. I might have to have quickly restart my computer here, I'm afraid. That's all right, not a problem. No problem, okay. I'll add you as a panelist again. Yeah, okay, no problem. Thank you. Okay. Um. Sorry for the slight delay, folks. Um, we've got a bit of a technical issue. Despite all our, our best practice um, with all of this, sometimes these things do still happen. Um, Professor Meyer will be rejoining us uh, very shortly. Um, he is just, just going to get everything back up and running. Um, Since but, this event is Tea Talk and Telescope, you might want to go refill your tea while we wait for the technical issues to be resolved. <laughs> as always a good shout. Always a good shout. You don't need to always just have tea. You could have juice or coffee, anything. <laughs> On campus, when we generally have these events in person, they're very, they're one of our best socials of the year in the sense that we get to have we get to have a lot of interaction with people across the department, across a lot of our our attendees as well, and and plus there's tea and coffee. We get to hang out in the coffee lounge and just chat about astrophysics and the topic at hand, and it's generally very enlightening. It's nice having to do everything virtually. It's a new experience for sure. In the meantime, I'll definitely point out that if you have any questions or anything, please do feel free to type them in the YouTube chat. And he's back. Excellent. The talk can resume soon. There we go. We can see the screen again, but I'm afraid we can't. We can't hear anything, can we? There we go. I just need to unmute myself. There we go. Apologies for that. It's one of those things that uh, I was listening to an REM album the other day, and they uh, they were doing sort of a live um, a live training, a live sort of rehearsal, and they called it an exercise in terror. Uh, that's a bit. That's a little bit like this, right? Um, I'm not going to be waving so much with my pointer because I think that's what's causing the, the hangups. So let me pick it up where, where I left off, where we're talking about I want to go beyond I, you need a supernova. This is a particularly nice example, uh, the Crep Nebula, which uh, was one of the brightest objects in the night sky in, in, the, in uh, 1056. Uh, wasn't noted here in, uh, well, I'm West, of course, we're in Western Europe, 
um, was primarily noted in the East, so in Japan and in, in China, uh, and in the Islamic world as well. So, composition-wise, we know that we're dealing with carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. So what about density? Uh, because that's very important in chemical reactivity as well. So just to give you an idea, and this is really uh, just orders of magnitude. If we think about the density of water, we have about 10 to the 28 molecules per cubic meter, give or take. Um, and the atmosphere at about one bar, of one bar pressure, it, it comes down to about 10 to the 25 molecules per cubic meter. Ultra high vacuum, the best we can do, we can bring that down by 12 orders of magnitude to 10 to the 13 molecules per cubic meter. That is still at least one order of magnitude and probably about three orders of magnitude higher than the, the most dense regions of, uh, of interstellar space where we find lots of molecules, so the so-called star forming regions. So that's already quite tenuous from our perspective. If you think about diffuse clouds where we find molecules as well, then we're really talking something more along the lines of about 10,000 uh, molecules per cubic meter. So the consequence of that is that any collisions between molecules will be slow. Uh, sorry, will not be slow, will be uh, uh, few and far between. They will only happen every now and again. And they will be bimolecular in nature. In other words, you will only get two things colliding with each other. And that has consequences. When you have reactions in, say, a liquid or in solution, then the liquid serves to take away excess heat when something forms. That kind of hex, uh, heat evaporation, that heat transfer is not possible in interstellar reactions. And therefore, certain reactions won't happen simply because the molecule you form is so highly internally excited that it will fall apart again. So what about temperature? Again, we could control temperature here on Earth to a large degree. If you think about it, if you take the CNBR as the sort of minimum temperature in the universe, so that's 2.8 Kelvin, uh, minus 270 odd centigrade. Uh, nebulae, where you find lots of molecules, 10 to 100 Kelvin, give or take. If you think Antarctica, 220 Kelvin. Average temperature on Earth, well, it's slowly creeping up. We all know that with, with global warming and everything like that, but 287 Kelvin, about 14 degrees C, give or take. If you think about the sun's photosphere, then we're talking one and a half million Kelvins. If you think about the sun's surface, then it's only 6,000, and in sunspots it's down to 3,000 Kelvin. Center of, the, center of the sun, of course, about 15 million Kelvin. So most of the temperatures you find in the universe actually tend to be like very low or very high. And neither of those are really terribly conducive to chemistry. Uh, very high temperatures, things will fall apart. Very low temperatures, things in particular, things with barriers won't really happen. So what about detection? I think that's, that's another key thing. So if we want to detect molecules, you need to consider a number of different things. First of all, abundance. There need to be enough of them there to be able to see. Now, telescopes get more and more sensitive all the time, but there is a certain lower limit below which you can't go. Thing which is underestimated is that you need lifetime as well. So in other words, if a molecule, there might be a lot of them, but they only exist for a very short time, actually, it still might be very difficult to detect them. And so you need to consider not just formation of molecules when you think about molecules in space, but you need to consider destruction as well. And so destruction can happen through collisions. It can happen through stray photons, X-ray or UV photons. Um, but for instance, also the solar wind, uh, any particles that come uh, that are emitted by, by the sun uh, will destroy molecules. And of course, cosmic rays will do so as well. And this is just a, a weak excuse to put a very nice picture up of the Aurora Borealis, which essentially is the solar wind coming out of our own star. And this is um, taken from the ISS. So it's a really nice, uh, really nice image. Uh, that's, of course, molecules there. That's oxygen uh, emanating in the green. OK. So I've already more or less indicated that despite all these hurdles, all these problems, um, we find molecules in, 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 the in, in space. So where do we find them? Well, we find them pretty much everywhere. Um, we find them in sunspots, for example, and I'll give you an example of that in, 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 in a second. Uh, we find them on comets, uh, the recent, uh, not so recent anymore, the, the Rosetta mission, of course, uh, uh, detected lots of uh, different kinds of molecules on, on these comets. Uh, this is not, um, the first comet that was ever uh, 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 photographed. This is a slightly older photograph of a uh, of a comet on the Bio Tapestry. That's Halley's Comet. Um, circumstellar disks um, 
of course, we live in a circumstellar disk. Uh, we know the Earth molecules there. This is a relatively young object. Um, the size, uh, the, the thing that's blotted out here is uh, about the size of the orbit of Saturn. And this is relatively close by. This is not too far away. This is Beta Victoris. Um, this object is a, a few million years old, so it's not that old yet. Um, and of course, nebulae, that's where we really find a lot of molecules. This is a nice image of the monkey head, uh, monkey head nebula. Um, I particularly like this one because this says really something very deep about how you observe stuff in, uh, in space. So this is famous image of M16, the Eagle Nebula. Um, and you can see that in the visible, you see the nice, you see the pillars of creation really very clearly. Um, and however, if you start looking in the infrared in the, in the, in the right-hand image, you can see that actually now you can look through the image. You can see what's either inside or behind there. And that's the key to understanding why molecules form in these kinds of regions. The areas uh, like the pillars of creation um, are so opaque to harsh light, uh, particularly UV, and, but also visible in an X-ray, that that kind of harsh uh, uh, radiation can't penetrate there, and therefore it's relatively benign. I mean, I, I use that the, the word relatively does really some heavy lifting there uh, because it's still quite harsh. I wouldn't really want to live there, let's be honest. Uh, it's a brilliant image. And if, if you take that one step further, it's a composite image. It's a slightly older version of the Pillars of Creation here on the top right. Uh, you can see that these objects look really very differently depending on how you look at them, what kind of wavelength of light you use. What is particularly interesting is here in the mid-infrared uh, that these uh, objects glow. And that's essentially just heat that's radiated away there. Um, heat that's engendered through collisions, molecules get excited, heat radiates away in that mid-infrared range. And therefore, these clouds cool and then allow stars to form. So molecules actually are very important in the formation of stars and probably uh, an underestimated component in there because they get rid of that excess heat in the collapsing cloud. Um, planetary nebulae, so this is right at the end of the lifetime, of course, of, of, of a star. This is the Helix Nebula, sometimes also referred to as God's Eye, if I remember correctly. Um, and I will show you a, 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 a more uh, extensive uh, example in uh, in a second because there's some really nice spectroscopy going on here. And then finally, uh, we can find uh, molecules on extraterrestrial planets as well. I mean, the Cassini-Huygens mission, which uh, didn't uh, uh, was only finished a, 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 few, a few years ago, really got some really good data on Titan in particular. Uh, this sort of kind of carbon chemistry, uh, carbohydrate chemistry uh, on Titan. Um, and so we find chemistry, we find molecules on extraterrestrial planets as well. This is, of course, the Saturn and Titan. Uh, this is a Hubble image. And Titan, you see the, the, uh, the shadow of Titan here on Saturn itself. So where do you find molecules in space? Well, pretty much everywhere. I mean, this is a, a very long list of, of where we found molecules. Um, we don't necessarily always know how they form, but we know that they're there. And um, it's about 200 molecules, we'll come to that in a sec. Um, and we've even found about 100 molecules in extragalactic sources as well. That's looking much further away. And the earliest molecule that uh, has been detected uh, was formed just after, well, relatively speaking, just after the Big Bang. So that's helium hydride cation. And that was formed about 300, 400,000 years after the Big Bang. So pretty early on in the lifetime of the universe. So which molecules have been found? Well, it, I say here more than 180, there's about five or six every year, uh, have been found in the Milky Way itself, uh, and about 55 molecules in extragalactic sources, so other galaxies other than our own. Uh, they tend to overlap. Molecules we found here, we tend to find elsewhere as well. So the kind of chemistry clearly is quite universal. And as I already indicated, those molecules are relatively rich, rich in hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, simply because of the abundance of the elements. It's as simple as that. They also tend to be quite unsaturated. So they tend to be highly reactive. And when you think about it, actually, that's not that surprising. Because the collision time, the time between collisions is very high, molecules that would react immediately here on Earth, particularly with oxygen, um, 
uh, just have time to exist there, build up that sort of uh, number density that you need in order to be able to detect them. If you want to uh, uh, have a list of what sort of molecules you find, then there's this website here at the bottom, which is really very uh, good, and it gives you references with papers and, and everything for the detection of these molecules. Okay, so a few examples. Uh, H2, CO, N2, OH, all molecules that are found here regularly on Earth. OH, of course, is this source of the OH maser that you may, that may know about. Um, Triatomics are water, CO2, uh, H3+, plus, which is very important for chemistry because it's a very good proton donor. And actually, it leads to, uh, for instance, very important in the formation of water, for example. Um, Tetrapentatomics, formaldehyde, uh, is, is uh, a conserving liquid, uh, methane. Um, pH3, uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, you might, if anybody wants, might, might, might want to ask me a question at the end, because there's a, this big, uh, uh, th this paper came out earlier, um, so last month, I can't remember now, about uh, pH3 on Venus and, and the, the possible detection of life on Venus. And I'll, 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 I have my opinion on that, and I'll, I'll be perfectly happy to talk about that afterwards. A few more examples. So these are, are getting more complicated. So benzene, again, is, is a solvent that we use here. It's, it's, it's something that you might be familiar with. Methyl formate is a very simple ester. Uh, again, it's a, um, acetone is a solvent that we use here. Uh, acetamide, again, is a solvent. Uh, so these are really common molecules here on Earth and molecules that we use in chemistry all the time. We find them up in space as well. Um, Acetonitrile, again, we use that as a solvent here. These two ones, buckyballs and CHC9N, are really interesting because there is a story behind those. So polyacetylides, which are the ones here at the bottom, are highly reactive. And actually, they are things that are really difficult to make here on Earth. There are, there are some possibilities. Um, as a matter of fact, um, when I was an undergraduate, they were trying to make this at the university where I was an undergraduate student at the University of Utrecht. And they managed to wreck three fume hoods in one experiment because of the explosive nature of the reaction. The reaction just got away from them and it just exploded uh, pretty heavily. Um, it was also the molecule that Harry Crota was trying to make when um, he invented or so he, detect he first made buckyballs. And buckyballs a C6, and he got the Nobel Prize in, in, in the 1980s uh, for that. Um, the reason why Harry Crota was interested in polyacetylides was at the time it was thought that they might be the carriers of some of the diffuse interstellar bands. Um, through a complete irony of, of, of uh, scientific enterprise, actually it turns out to be buckyballs, C60 plus in particular, that are the only molecules that have been um, uh, have been now conspicuously been detected as being the carriers of two interstellar bands. And some really interesting experimental uh, chemistry or actually experimental spectroscopy underlying that. And again, if you want to know more about it, just ask me a question uh, at the end. So how do we find molecules? I've sort of indicated already how we find them. Um, Astronomy, and that might be a slightly controversial opinion uh, in, in a room full of astronomers, um, is really applied spectroscopy. So it's the same kind of spectroscopy that we use in the lab, except instead of a laser, you have a star. Instead of a, a, an LED detector, you have a massive telescope. Uh, instead of a small cuvette with a sample, you have a massive uh, you know, column density between the star and, and, and the telescope. So it's a slightly grander scale, but essentially the principles are exactly the same. So telescopes, uh, uh, this is something uh, that, that you should all know about. If you talk about ground state, then you talk about so the European Southern Observatory, particularly uh, ALMA is a, um, uh, a good source of, of, of data for this. I've got Jodl Bank here in, uh, here in the UK. So that's radio waves. Uh, of course, you can talk about big telescopes as well, the VLT and, and so on, and the ones in Hawaii where you look in the visible. They tend to be very high up, of course, to, to minimize atmospheric distortion. But really, for good visible images, you want to go to space. So Hubble, Spitzer, Chandra, the upcoming James Webb telescope which is going to be a really interesting exercise because of where it's placed outside the Earth uh, moon uh, system. Uh, it's going to be uh, really exercise. We might have a very heavy uh, book, uh, book, token, book weight um, 
and yeah, thingy in, in space there, a door stop in space. And of course, orbiters. So Dawn, Mars Explorer, the Voyages, um, all sorts of other, uh, Cassini Huygens uh, and so on. Um, of course, yeah, then the probes and space missions, so Rosetta, Philae, Cassini Huygens, Stardust, Manned space flight actually is not on that list because it's not that important in, in, in the context of the kind of stuff that I'm interested in because getting people in space is expensive and it's just really, really tough. Actually, sending a robot up there is much, uh, is much nicer. Okay, so I already mentioned planetary nebulae for, uh, uh, for molecules. So how do you, does the detection work? Well, okay, so let's look at this object here. So right at the end, uh, star has gone out, we're, le we're left with just the remnants of the, their solar system, the planetary nebula. And so you do a survey of uh, this, this system, and this is CO, carbon monoxide, which is often used as a, as a tracer for molecules, for uh, um, sort of um, environments which are conducive to the formation of molecules. And so this is 150 gigahertz, the, uh, the P1 transition in carbon monoxide. And so if we zoom in, we can see uh, at the, uh, in the sort of spectrum underneath, you see all the CO peaks appearing in exactly the right place. Uh, you see multiple peaks, so you can uh, absolutely, absolutely see that. We are really talking about CO because you can look at the progression of these lines. The spacing needs to be such that it corresponds to CO. And actually there's some OH plus here as well. So there's another molecule there as well. Right, okay, so this is a slightly different image, the same object, but a slightly different image. And this is H2. And please allow me to geek out here for, 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 for a few minutes, because this is really unusual. So CO has a dipole moment, and therefore it actually has allowed transitions, rotational transitions, and therefore it emits uh, infrared radiation quite readily. H2 doesn't have a dipole moment, and therefore doesn't have a rotational spectrum but it does have a quadrupole moment. And what you see here is what is uh, often called the S, br S branch. So there's a transition, the rotational transition between uh, zero and two and four and six and so on. And they're really unusual. You wouldn't really see them here on Earth because their lifetime is just way too long. The lifetime of these excited states is on the order of 5,200 years. So in any Earth-based experiment, you would never actually see them. So how do we find, uh, we'll actually come back to this image in, uh, later on. So how do we find the molecules? Well, okay, we measure them, but of course measuring them is not really sufficient enough because you're really only measuring the transitions between levels and not the levels themselves. So you have to back them up with experiments. So do really accurate spectroscopic measurements here on earth and I particularly look at rates. So one of the important things that you want to, uh, when you detect a molecule, you have to figure out how it got there. Well, it's easier for CO because it's just carbon plus oxygen that gives you CO, uh, maybe via a slightly circuitous route, but it's relatively straightforward. If you start thinking about more complicated molecules, uh, methyl formate, benzene, buckyballs, then actually you need to have a way to actually make them. And so you have to have an understanding of the reactions that are leading up to the molecule that you're really interested in. So you need to measure the rates for those reactions. And if some of those rates are very small, then actually that route is not viable. But you also need to do theory, and that's why you know, where I come in. So you need to do accurate calculations on the spectra. So not just the transitions, but of course you need to model all the external influences as well. The astronomical modeling is important as well. So you need to know what sort of uh, magnetic field you have, what sort of radiation pressure, and so on and so forth. Um, you need to uh, when you've measured the rates, you need to build up a, a model of the kind of reactions that can happen and turn that into um, a reaction scheme. And I'll show you an example of that in a second. Really, what you need to do is you need to do quantum dynamics on, on these systems to really get accurate uh, rates, uh, uh, much more accurate than you could potentially measure. But actually, that's still very, very tricky. Uh, so sort of stuff that actually that we do. Okay, so what sort of what sort of uh, spectroscopic evidence do you have? Well, this is um, water on the sun. It's in a sunspot. Uh, it's a famous paper by Oka, and 
it's one of those papers where I was looking through a list of people who were predicted to perhaps win a Nobel Prize this year. And Oka was one of the list for astrochemistry. And this is one of his seminal papers in that area. So what you have here at the top is the infrared spectrum of superheated water. And here we have uh, both in the umbra and the penumbra uh, water spectrum lying underneath. And you can see the lines here and the lines above here line up to a reasonable degree. Um, these very large peaks here are terrestrial water, so you have to discount those. One of my, uh, uh, somebody I know really well, Professor Jonathan Tennyson, is actually looking at water in these kinds of harsh environments to try to model these spectra. And actually, what it turns out to, to happen is that you can't just rely on uh, a potential energy surface. You actually have to start including things like a Zeeman effect and all sorts of influence of magnetic uh, uh, properties of the water molecule in, it in order to get these lines really, really right. And he's been uh, constantly refining this for, for, for the past uh, 10, 15 years or so. And that's just water. Right, so how do you make molecules? Well, you make molecules in lots of different ways. And it really depends on where you look as to what sort of reactions you can have. So you can have gas phase reactions. Um, so uh, bimolecular, obviously. Um, gas surface reactions, that's why these dust grains really come into, uh, come into their own. Um, because they form a concentrating um, uh, medium where you can lots of atoms together that actually then can take a slightly longer time to react. And you can actually have interactions with light. Really, that becomes important as well, interaction with cosmic rays as well. Um, but those cosmic rays, in particular, when they hit um, surfaces, they can uh, liberate electrons through the photoelectric effect, or they can interact with the ices that are covering these particular dust grains. So ices could be water ice, CO, CO2, uh, oxygen, nitrogen, uh, whatever. So they can actually um, liberate electrons, primary or secondary electrons in these, uh, in these species, and therefore actually engender uh, uh, reactivity. So in gas phase reaction, we actually do a lot of theory. Uh, in gas surface reaction, we're really in, the infant, uh, in, in its infancy at the moment because that's a really tough nut to crack. The precise mechanism really depends on where you look. So different regions of the universe will have different mechanisms of going to the same molecules, but they all start from atoms. And to give you an example, oops, sorry, no, let me just first, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, where are these regions that these reactions take place? Well, um, this is a pretty nice example. It's the coal sack in, in, in Crookes. And that's again, this sort of idea that you have uh, uh, dust grains here, which filter all the harsh light, light out and therefore you can have reactions here. Um, Herschel named, named, uh, called these, these areas holes in the sky. And um, the Incas, who were known, uh, who knew this particular uh, constellation, Crooks, because it's in the Southern Hemisphere, they thought that one of their gods had been very angry, and actually kicked a hole in the sky as a consequence. Um, so, we find molecules in these sort of regions, the dusty regions of space, for instance, nebulae, and the dust grains are, tend to be carbonaceous, so uh, uh, soot particles, or silicaceous, so essentially just dirty sand, if you wish, um, covered in ices, and those ices, as I said, are, are things like water or CO2 or, 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 um, uh, or nitrogen. And it really depends on the temperature, what sort of ices you have. If the ices are hotter, if the, the area is hotter, then you tend to find uh, mainly water ice. If it gets colder, then even um, molecules that don't really freeze out terribly well, like, uh, like methane or nitrogen, gets, um, get fr frozen out on those, those dust grains. The densities are relatively high there, so about 10 to the 6 molecules per cubic meter. And the temperatures are definitely not higher than 4,000 Kelvin. Uh, it can be as low as 10 Kelvin. We really find most of the molecules in these kinds of regions. And then again, which molecules form really depends on the local conditions. So early on, you tend to have uh, relatively simple molecules, H2 in particular, and CO, and more complex molecules form later on. And I'll show you uh, uh, some examples of that in a second. So the role of dust actually is that it shields the molecule from radiation. 
but it's also a catalyst, as I said. It interacts with light, it, uh, through a photoelectric effect, uh, liberates electrons to give you further reaction. So it functions as a catalyst, effectively, uh, in the way that we, we use, for instance, platinum or palladium uh, in, in reactions here on Earth. Of course, those dust grains also are the basis for comets. They are the basis of any planets that might form. That's why our planets consist largely of silicon uh, or silicaceous materials. But they also concentrate all the heavy elements. And heavy elements, uh, transition metal elements, are particularly good at catalysis. So you will find things like iron and so on in those heavy elements. There is a flip side to that as well. Because those heavy elements actually concentrate in those dust grains, they're not available in the, the gas phase to do reactions there. So the depletion of the elements uh, steers the reactivity in a certain direction as well. So let me give you an example of a molecule. We actually done quite a bit of work on this. Um, so H2 formation. Okay, so how do you form H2? It's the most ubiquitous, most important molecule in space. How do you form it? Well, the first option would be you just get three hydrogen atoms that combine together to form H2 and it gives you hydrogen atom. Well, I already told you, no three body reaction. So this is definitely out of the question. The densities are just simply not high enough to allow you to do this. Okay, well, let's do it more simply. Two hydrogen atoms coming together, giving you H2 plus a photon. Well, hydrogen doesn't have a dipole moment. And so actually releasing a photon uh, via dipole transition is not possible for hydrogen. You can release a photon through a, um, a quadrupole transition as I, a transition, as I just showed you. Um, but the lifetime of those states is 50 years. By that time, those two hydrogen atoms will have flown apart again. Absolutely no dice. Uh, I, I talked to this with a, um, a friend of mine who's an astronomer, and she said that um, probably about three molecules in the entire lifetime of the universe were probably formed in this particular way. Uh, she might be over-exaggerating. There are two other mechanisms which uh, I definitely want to mention here. You could have a radiative association between hydrogen and electron, giving you H minus plus a photon. And then H minus could react with hydrogen to give you H2 plus an electron. That's definitely possible. Uh, H minus has a dipole moment, so therefore can release a photon. Um, problem is that this reaction is just too slow. We know roughly how much H2 is out there. Uh, at the moment, and basically the rates for formation via this route are just too slow for this uh, to happen at the moment. Similarly, you can have a proton plus a, a hydrogen atom to give you H2 plus plus a photon, and then that reacts to give you hydrogen and H2 back again. Again, that's too slow. That's about five or six orders of magnitude too slow to give you the densities of H2 that, you, that we know are out there. So H2 must be formed on a surface grain. And so models should include both gas surface and surface chemistry because this very important molecule actually just forms on surfaces. Interestingly, it really depends on what timeline you're looking at. There is um, a school of thought that actually thinks that these first, these second two reactions, uh, formation of H minus and H2 plus, are really important in the early universe in the formation of H2, uh, but definitely not at the moment. So. Well, if you put everything together, this is what you get. This is a, a, a very small portion of a network. Um, so how do you form H2O, water? Well, you can actually start with CO, which sounds kind of uh, counterintuitive. CO is a very good sink for both oxygen and carbon, and it reacts with H3, H3 plus to give you HCO plus. You can start with O plus, reacts with H2 and gets you all the way to H3O plus. That reaction there will give you water and will give you your CO back again, and H2. Um, you can start at high temperature with oxygen, react with H2, again with H2 to give you water. But at the same time, you can do the same thing on surfaces as well. So if you want to understand how water forms, you need to know about all of these processes. You need to know what the rate is for this reaction. You need to know what the rate is for this reaction, but also you need to know what the rate is for the reaction going, uh, reactions going back. You need to also know how you can, uh, you know, how likely it is that oxygen will freeze out on a surface, or how likely it is that it will desorb from a surface, and what the temperature will do in this respect, or what other photons will do in this respect. So those kind of uh, networks get, tend to get very big. Uh, you know, 
tens of thousands of reactions, including uh, uh, many surface reactions as well. A lot of those reactions, we actually don't know the rates for, so we're just going to guess them and see whether those guesses look like anything like uh, uh, the real number coming out. Some of those, and particularly the ones that we're sensitive to, we uh, people have actually measured them, uh, and they are just put in those models at that point. So what's the role of molecules? What are molecules there for? Well, molecules are actually very important. Um, well, they're important for us because it gives us uh, some interesting things to look at and, and, and gives us an idea of what stuff happens over there. So there are four aspects here that I want to highlight in the, last, uh, in, 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 in the remaining 15 minutes or so. And the first one is that molecules really can be viewed as either a probe for local conditions or as a chemical clock. It tells you uh, something about evolution of um, uh, uh, of a certain object in time. As I said, hydrogen forms first, H2, and more complex molecules form afterwards. So therefore, the idea is that uh, you can tell from when certain species, particularly certain more complex species arrive, uh, how far along a certain object is. So chemistry doesn't happen in isolation, and molecules in particular are a reflection of the local conditions. So they're a reflection of the abundances, what sort of elements you have, um, uh, particularly if there are lots of dust grains around, which might catalyze certain reactions, but it also depends on the physical conditions. So the degree of ionization, whether you're in a region where there's a lot of ionizing radiation or a, a region where there is not a lot of ionizing radiation, and therefore that gives you either um, uh, reactions going through uh, cations or reactions going through neutral species. Uh, cosmic rays are important as well because cosmic rays are really important drivers for chemistry. Um, they interact with dust grains to give you uh, electrons via the photoelectric effects, for example, but also they are very good at ionizing hydrogen and helium in particular. And once you have H plus or once you have helium plus in particular, actually helium plus is very good at picking up electrons from somewhere else because of its very high ionization energy. And so therefore, even though I said beforehand, uh, right at the start, that helium was very boring and not terribly interesting in terms of reactivity, it does play an important role because it hoovers up electrons. And so it's very easy for a charge exchange reaction to happen with helium plus. So if you have something like, well, let's say uh, carbon monoxide, CO, uh, helium plus comes along, it will turn into CO, CO plus, and that's a lot more reactive than carbon monoxide, which is actually just a big sink for uh, carbon, both carbon and oxygen. And of course, the densities play a role as well. If you have something which is relatively dense, you have relatively a lot of uh, collisions. Um, if you don't have something which is dense, then there's not a lot of collisions, not a lot of chemistry happening. And in that case, uh, you will find that molecules tend to fly apart. So for instance, if you think about diffuse clouds, there are not many molecules there, apart from two, uh, which is H2 and CO. And that's because they are actually what, what is called in the, in, in the, um, in the trade, they're self-shielding. So in other words, there are only specific uh, frequencies of light that will actually make them fall apart. And if you have enough H2 there, then those frequencies of light gets absorbed by those molecules that are there, and you're left with some other molecules of H2 that essentially can't be uh, broken up because uh, the frequencies that would do that are no longer present in the solar spectrum. So, as I said, more complex uh, uh, molecules occur later in the evolution of a cloud, and that gives you a galactic clock. Um, so, for example, to give you an idea, uh, some people have suggested that sulfur species could form uh, a very good clock for the evolution of uh, the formation, formation of a protostar. So initially, you will get hydrogenated species. Hydrogen is very common, so you will get H2S, uh, hydrogen sulfide. Uh, frozen out on grain. OCS is another stable molecule. Then when a star starts to heat up, um, you get lots of uh, radiation and you start to form things like SO, SO2, SO3, uh, sulfur, monoxide, dioxide, and trioxide. And they will occur later, therefore, in that, uh, in that cycle. And therefore, the presence of things like SO3 might tell you that this star, this object is further along than what you originally thought it was. So it gives you a clock, essentially a, a weird sort of clock uh, uh, that allows you to track development. Um, 
it also gives you a reflection of uh, local conditions. Right, it's the only equation I have. So I've, I've kept it relatively light on equations. Um, this expression here is something called the Boltzmann law. And it's basically the basis of something called statistical thermodynamics. But essentially what it says is that the number of molecules in one state, the ratio of the number of molecules in one state over the number of molecules in another state is in equilibrium given uh, is proportional to this exponential here. It's essentially proportional, uh, um, exponentially proportional to the difference, the energy difference uh, between the two states. Okay, so that, what that says is at a given temperature, I can predict what the distribution of my molecules over states is going to be. That gives me a ratio, but if I know how many molecules I have in a given state, then I know what sort of emission or absorption intensities I should expect in my spectroscopy, because those intensities are proportional to the number density um, that I have. And so if I detect the emission intensity between several transitions between states, I get a measure of both the density and of the temperature of the object. Just to give you an example, so this is back going back at H2 in the helix nebula. So I showed you uh, H2, I said it was the S branch, and the measurements are actually given here, are those peaks here. And those are S2, S3, S4, et cetera. And if I plot that uh, on a log plot, then this is what you get. You get a really nice straight line uh, with intensity. So S2 is the highest intensity, S7 is the lowest intensity. So this is seven to five, um, uh, six to four, five uh, to three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. As I say, uh, these are very unusual because the lifetime is very large. Uh, in normal circumstances, about 50 to 100 years, where you can measure them. And because we have this distribution, we can actually calculate what the temperature is. And assuming that this is an equilibrium, that's a very big assumption, then the rotational temperature of H2 in the helix nebula is about 900 Kelvin. So it's very high. Uh, compared to what you what you would expect. That's also interesting in other right because these kind of planetary nebulae uh, uh, get some really uh, interesting molecules, really complicated molecules, and those high temperatures are really necessary to actually get those molecules to form. Molecules are also very important as coolants from right on. So if you think about the following reaction, and I put the word reaction here in inverted commas just to um, to, um, um, it's not quite a reaction as such. If I have H2 plus CO, which is non-rotating, and I turn that into H2 and a rotating CO molecule, so I rotationally excite carbon monoxide, then that rotating carbon monoxide can emit a photon uh, to turn back into a non-rotating one, J equals zero, uh, with infrared light. That infrared light, the clouds are transparent to infrared light, so that infrared light will leave the cloud and that energy is lost to that cloud. So if you think, and you know a lot more about than I do, about star formation, so there's a balance between the gravitational collapse of a cloud and the pressure going out because the, uh, the, the gas is heating up, this actually allows some of that heat to disappear and therefore the collapse can continue uh, the, collapse can contract, uh, the cloud can contract further, and therefore you get star formation. So I would argue that without molecules, actually there wouldn't be any stars whatsoever. So chemistry uh, is really important in, in rather right at the, at the, at the root of, uh, of astronomy. That's also uh, even from the earliest age. We, we, we know that things like uh, hydrogen helium plus or helium hydride, cation and H2 are formed quite early in the lifetime of the universe. This is probably even the case for very early stars as well, not just in the current time. Um, so when you talk about star forming regions, and really this is the, the mid infrared is where you see those things coming out. Um, and as you see, see a nice glow there as well. Right, so molecules from space could also be important for the origins of life. And this is slightly more speculative. So please bear with me. This is, I'm going a bit out on a limb here. So the Earth formed about five billion years ago, and we know that it solidified at a roughly 4.3 billion years ago, give or take. Uh, you know, those timescales are, uh, are quite, uh, quite uncertain in that respect. 
we also know that depending on when the first solidification happened, that life, the most primitive life forms, uh, primitive single cell, single cell life forms, um, developed about 400 million years after that, give or take. Those simple life forms are still already quite similar to more complex ones that we have to this date. Actually, they're in some aspects very similar to the way we are as well. Um, so life formed really very quickly. And that leads you to the questions, how likely actually is life? Does life form everywhere, everywhere in the universe? Or does it just form here on Earth? But it's certainly developed very quickly. So there are essentially three schools of thought about this. The first one says that life is extraterrestrial in origin. In other words, alien bacteria came here and, and colonized our planet. Um, the downside there is that you could argue that essentially that just moves the, uh, uh, the, the, the question of the origin of life to a different planet. So essentially it postpones or, 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 or moves the question somewhere else. Um, did life form entirely here on Earth from building blocks, atoms and molecules here on Earth? That's called abiogenesis. Or is there some sort of halfway house where um, life that developed here on Earth essentially uses extraterrestrial building blocks, sometimes referred to as pseudo or soft panspermia? And let's just speculate on that, because if that's the case, then we need to find those, we need to be able to find those building blocks. So the kind of building blocks that you're talking about are things that are called complex organic molecules. And those are things that actually we've become more interested in over the last few years because there's a lot of work done in that area. So a lot of observations and a lot of experiments as well. So, for example, um, one molecule that has been detected is glycoaldehyde. And it doesn't look like anything, but actually glycoaldehyde is a very simple sugar. Uh, as a, a, a carbonyl, functionality, it has a hydroxy functionality. It's a very simple sugar. And actually, it's a key step in the formation of ribose. And we all know ribose because that's part of our DNA. Uh, that's the R in, 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 in desoxyribonucleic acid. Of course, we could form something like glycine. Glycine, simple amino acid. Um, it's here in red because it's not really been detected yet. There has been some tentative detections uh, of, of glycine. And, um, but in principle, you know, if we can find amino acids, say that, that would be brilliant as well. Um, there is one other molecule here that I just want to, want to highlight because we just did some work on that, and that's urea. So urea is a byproduct of our metabolism, uh, and it was the first ever molecule that was uh, synthesized abiotically. So even though it's a biological molecule, molecule that is important to us, it was the first molecule that was ever formed abiotically. And it showed that actually, Biological molecules and non-biological molecules and essentially are very simple, uh, very, very similar. So it's very simple. But actually, if you take urea and you take another urea, then you can form this molecule here if you lose ammonia. And if you put acetylene, which has been detected as well with that as well, you can form cytosine and uracil. So urea has been detected in, in a number of places, one in Sagittarius and another one uh, only fairly recently. Um, and so urea is out there. I know we are. Acetylene is out there. So it's perfectly possible that those building blocks would come here to give you things like cytosine and uracil quite quickly. Another molecule that I should mention in this concept, context is uh, HCN. HCN is um, hydrogen cyanide, uh, which is massively poisonous. Um, but if you polymerize it, you get something which looks suspiciously like a polymer. Uh, uh, an amino acid polymer, i.e. A, a protein. And so HCN could be the basis for uh, a protein. So the, the protein polymers might have existed before the individual uh, amino acids themselves. HCN is also involved in the formation of things like adenosine and uh, guanine, two other DNA bases. Interestingly, the fifth one, uh, thymine, the T in, 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 in the genetic code, you can't really make very easily from simple building blocks. And that sort of tells you that RNA, which uses uracil rather than thymine, actually came before DNA. Right, so in the last two minutes, let me just uh, convince you of chemistry as the central science in all of this. 
So chemistry really is very important and probably underestimated in, in the way the universe operates. Uh, formation of hydrogen molecules or uh, uh, helium hydride cation in the early universe allows for the formation of the first stars of the Big Bang because of its ab ability to radiate away heat. Those stars turn hydrogen into heavier elements, particularly carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen, which leads to molecules. Of course, stars are the, basically the ultimate recycling apparatus. They build up these elements, and at the end of their life, they actually put all these elements back into the interstellar medium to form molecules and to form the basis for new stars. Um, so in the current universe, it's mainly CO and H2 that allows uh, molecular clouds to collapse, leading to new stars, but also uh, building blocks uh, like uh, black planets and so on and so forth. And those the dust grains uh, definitely weren't there in the early universe, formed the raw material for planets. And therefore, that's why we have the planet we have. I hope I've convinced you that the kind of chemistry that we do here on Earth, that my colleagues do in their labs, actually isn't that much different from the kind of chemistry that happens up there in space. The molecules tend to be slightly different. They tend to be dominated in slightly different ways. But actually, the kind of ideas that you have about chemistry here apply very stringently to the chemistry that happens up there as well. And please allow me to finish with a, a quote by uh, one of my favorite authors, Douglas Adams. So far out in the uncharted backwaters of the unfashionable end of the western spiral arm of the galaxy lies a small unregarded yellow sun. Orbiting this at a distance of roughly 98 million miles is an utterly insignificant little blue-green planet whose eight descended life forms are so amazingly primitive that they still think digital watches are a pretty neat idea. I like this quote because to some extent it puts us in our place. Chemistry here is nothing special. Uh, it happens everywhere, really. Uh, whether life is special here, I don't know, and I can't really judge that. But definitely chemistry is completely universal, and we're just a really small cog in a very big machine. And with that, um, I would like to thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. I'd like to say thank you very, very much, um, Anthony. That is, that is a truly, truly fascinating talk. I know that I personally have got uh, a couple of questions to ask you. Um, but honestly, that was a, a lovely ride through um, the evolution of, uh, well, of everything that we, we know and see uh, to date. So thank you very, very much. Okay. I think that was an absolutely delightful talk. We have um, just one question from YouTube, uh, which I'll pose to you in, in a little bit. Um, but I, I would like to start off by uh, going back to, to one of the points you, you raised, um, which was that of the, the possible uh, detection of phosphine uh, in mm -hmm. the clouds of Venus. Now, personally, I'm interested in exoplanets, um, as, as I spoke to you just before we went live about. Um, and I guess that if we can possibly detect phosphine uh, and, and perhaps may, many other molecules uh, in, in our nearby planets. What do you think might be the, um, the promises of detecting similar uh, molecules with, with possible biological origins uh, around other stars uh, and in fact in, other, in the atmospheres of other planets? So of, of course, the further away you go, the more difficult it gets. You know, Venus is very close by and it makes, makes it easier in a sense. Um, the other thing I want to say as well about the detection of phosphines, um, there was a paper posted in Archive uh, a few weeks ago, pretty much, pretty much straight after the other paper came out, where they looked at the data as well and said, no, there is no, no phosphine whatsoever. Um, I would think oxygen actually is probably a more interesting uh, molecule to look at simply because it is a byproduct of things like photosynthesis and, uh, and so on. So probably... Uh, oxygen is one that would look at more uh, more clearly. Phosphines. Uh, the other thing, criticism, if you wish, they did that work really carefully for for the phosphine paper. I had a look through it, and actually the conclusions from the paper were as sensationalist as the press release would allow you to believe. Um, they looked at a, a very limited number of lines. I think that it was mainly one particular line that they were looking at, which is an indicator for phosphine, but therefore it opens you up to uh, all sorts of biases that you might not be able to, uh, might be able to spot. Actually, if you had been able to spot more lines, it would have been much more 
definite detection of, uh, of phosphine. Um, so I would, I would go with things that actually have a large IR uh, or, or a large cross-section for absorption of light. So water, uh, well, okay, water is, is, is not terri uh, terribly good at giving you indication of life, but oxy oxygen, uh, well, oxygen, you get quadrupole. But you want to look for molecules actually that have a significant dipole so you can actually see them quite, quite, clear, quite clearly. Um, whether it's possible to find more life outside our own solar system, outside our, I don't know, I honestly don't know. Um, before, a, a month ago, I would have said, look at Ganymede, look at Europa, uh, particularly because Europa might have liquid water, which uh, might be very important because of its, uh, of its uh, sort of solution chemistry. Uh, because it's a polar solvent, because it actually is a solvent that allows you to have protection because of the ice layer on top of it. Um, but to some extent, my thoughts on that, of course, are influenced by the way life developed here. Who knows? I mean, life might develop in a very different way uh, somewhere else. Excellent. Uh, th thank you very much for, for that answer. I believe we do have a question on the YouTube chat. Mm -hmm. um, so they've asked, do we find molecules in black holes? Well, we don't know. Really. Inside black holes, of course, we don't know. We, we don't know what's there. Uh, in, in a sense, um, well, the, 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 the general uh, aspect of it is that you, you know, if you fall into a black hole, essentially once you go beyond the event horizon, you get spectrification, all sorts of stuff. Because we can't look inside the, the black hole, we, know, we don't know. I would think that everything goes back down to, to elementary particles at that point. I don't know how close they've been able to look to a black hole to see whether there are any molecules there. I, I'm not aware of any specific studies. Uh, of that. One of the things that is actually uh, quite important to, to highlight is that when you do uh, a chemistry experiment and you measure something here, you generally know what's inside your cuvette. And you know it's going to be hopefully one particular molecule or particular type of molecule. But if it's not that, then you know what sort of other stuff is there. So you can discount that when you do the measurement. If you do an astronomical experiment, uh, then you measure everything that's between you and the source, the star. And that can be stuff which is close by, that can be stuff which is further away, but in principle, you're measuring everything. And so therefore, uh, you tend to look at objects which are in places that are not terribly um, busy with other things. You want to look at singular objects to be able to get a, a singular idea of what's going on there, rather than have to look through uh, a lot of uh, cloud or, or whatever to, to, to do your measurement. So we tend not to look through to our own uh, galactic center because that tends to be very uh, a very busy area. And so therefore, I'm not entirely sure whether people have actually tried to look for molecules close to black holes. It would be an interesting one to look at, actually. But I, I might suggest it to, to one of my collaborators to see what they, uh, what they can find. Awesome. Thank, thank you very much. Um, another thing that you mentioned uh, during your talk was obviously the upcoming launch of James Webb. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything in particular that you, uh, in, in your field of study, are hoping that James Webb might turn up in terms of uh, further identification of, of molecules? So, so the particular thing, so uh, we've done a lot, of, uh, so people have done a lot of work, of course, with, uh, with ground-based uh, arrays. Alma in particular is, is very good. So the thing that people are looking forward to uh, with James Webb is, is two things. One is that the very high resolution of James Webb, uh, um, which is going to allow us to look at things uh, with a lot more detail. The second thing is that James Webb will be particularly uh, uh, potent in, um, in the sort of the area of where you would look for gas surface or surface interactions. So things inside uh, surfaces. So if you do rotational spectroscopy, you will find some, but the, 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 the modes inside a solid tend to be at lower frequency and, and Hubble is not particularly good in that particular range. Um, and so therefore James Watt will be stronger there and we would hope that they would find more um, on how surfaces, how ices work and what kind of reactions you can get in ices. Because it's those ices 
that will then uh, give you reaction and will give you, for instance, complex organic molecules. So all of those complex organic molecules that I showed you, glycoaldehyde, methyl formate, um, acetic acid, so vinegar in a sense uh, as well, they're all formed relatively late and they're formed in regions where we would ex have expected to, uh, for ISIS to be present. So one particular uh, scheme that people think of when they think about the formation of these complex organics is, okay, um, cosmic rays comes in, ionizes uh, things like formaldehyde and methanol. Those molecules will stay there for a while, and then once it warms up, they will start to move. We see the product, and we see the ultimate starting point. We see the methanol and we see the formaldehyde. We don't really see anything intermediate there. So if you can have a, a closer look at those uh, HCO radical, uh, so that's formaldehyde radical, or uh, uh, CH3O, so that's the uh, methanol radical. And actually, we could get, get an idea of how abundant these are, because that gives us a handle on what sort of molecules might form afterwards. If you primarily form methoxide radical, so CH3O, you ex expect to form something like methylformate. If you, on the other hand, form something like uh, the methylene hydroxide, so CH2OH, then you expect to form glycoaldehyde, for example. And we know there are imbalances in those, but how they come about, we don't really know. So actually being able to look closer into those, those, those solid materials actually might get us some really interesting, uh, um, really interesting sort of uh, insight in how these reactions happen. Sounds like a promising area. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I know that I'm certainly looking forward to the some of the first results being published by James Webb myself. <laughs> I'm actually involved in organising a conference, uh, which was supposed to happen next year, uh, but because the the, the telescope, uh, the launch of the telescope was postponed and was postponed a couple of times, and actually postponed it by a year, so, and that will be in Baltimore. So it will be interesting because that's the uh, the grand centre for the James Webb Telescope. So it will be really interesting to have a look around. Very much so. Very much so, thank you. I've also got another question. Um, so several times like in the past I've come across you know, articles and several sources how they report that Titan, one of the moons in the outer solar system, it has a lot of like an abundance of methane and ethane. Mm -hmm. And they say that Titan could be a decent candidate for what Earth would have looked like in its early days. So I was just wondering if you could perhaps shed some more light on how promising do you think this approach would be in terms of studying methane and ethane to sort of, you know, just know about Earth's past? Well, that's an interesting question because that, that's an open, an open question. There is a, um, uh, I wouldn't say controversy, but um, there's definitely uncertainty about what the Earth, early Earth would have looked like. We know it started off molten and then somewhat solidified, but what the atmosphere looked like actually is unclear. Um, so there are some really early experiments, some really nice experiments by uh, Yuri and Miller in the late 50s, early 60s, where essentially they took things like uh, ammonia, uh, um, CH4, uh, so methane, uh, water, and they essentially just sparked it and then just let it just circle around and they got things like uh, glycine, valine, all sorts of amino acids and all sorts of really interesting biological molecules. The controversy then comes in how reducing the, the Earth's atmosphere at that point really was. So in other words, was it like Titan? Um, was it like um, the atmosphere of Jupiter, which is what uh, Yuri and Miller based their particular experiment on? Or was it a lot milder? And therefore, you would have to start looking at different ways of um, uh, of, of forming um, biological molecules. Um, in particular, what is important in that context is that as soon as you get any oxygen, O2, in that reaction mixture of Yuri Miller, essentially that kills the reaction stone dead. And so if the atmosphere is more oxidizing, in other words, much more oxygen out there, then you really have to start thinking very hard what sort of reactions could happen to give you the kind of building blocks that you need. So I think the jury, I think the answer is the jury is out on that one. It's an interesting one. Um, Titan is interesting in other, uh, uh, so we have, of course, a water cycle. In, in Titan, they have a, a methane cycle. Um, Titan is actually is an interesting uh, planet to look at, or 
planetoid or, or, or moon to look at. Um, if you want to think about the formation of life, and as, as I said, Ganymede or Europa are probably the ones I look at first, simply because in the case of Europa, you have the, the likelihood of, of, of liquid water. In the case of Ganymede, of course, because of the tidal forces, uh, you get uh, some, some heat and therefore it's not as, as massively cold. That's why I actually was surprised that people uh, looked at Saturn for the possibility, oh, sorry, at the Venus for the possibility of life. That was not the planet I would have looked at. Well, speaking of like of Europa and perhaps having the possibility of having liquid water under the ice, I was it immediately just occurred to me how there's several studies going on in Antarctica where they're searching for lives like under the ice, and I'm just like it just occurred to me that perhaps like do you think it would be promising to continue extensive searches on Earth for life forms under the Antarctic ice, for instance, and would this necessarily be relevant at all to what we would expect to find in other moons which have icy shells? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so when we talk about life on, on other planets uh, or, or, or moons, we sort of, the, the almost the first image we have is, oh, well, it will look like us. Uh, you know, it, it will be bipedal, it will be sort of uh, wearing glasses uh, and so on, it will be intelligent. Life is, to some extent, much more. Uh, I would be perfectly happy in my lifetime we would find bacteria somewhere else. Um, so, in that case, you should really start to think about extremophiles. Uh, so, uh, bacteria uh, and one celled organisms that really thrive on really extreme circumstances. But one of the things that you shouldn't forget either is that, of course, on Earth we live a really protected uh, uh, um, existence in a really harsh environment. The, the, the Van Allen belt, the magnetosphere surrounding the Earth, the permanent magnetic field, make sure that actually we get, yeah, we get the aurora borealis and the, the aurora australis, the, the, the northern southern lights, but really a lot of the ionizing radiation or the UV radiation gets absorbed by the, by the ozone layer. And so therefore actually life is pretty good here. If you go anywhere else, and it can be Mars, it, uh, it can be some of the outer planets or outer moons, then actually, you really need something that can can uh, sort of exist in that sort of extreme circumstances. And so you're looking at things that really like extreme stuff. So therefore looking under Antarctica, looking in places deep inside mountains where you have um, bacteria that essentially uh, almost live on, 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 the, on the minute bits of water that you might find there. Um, if you look at hydrothermal vents here on Earth, where you find uh, bacteria as well that that, uh, that use iron sulfide, for example, to, to to get their energy. Those are the kinds of things you need to look at. And there's a, a lot of stuff that we don't know yet. Um, those things are hard to get to. If you want to drill a hole, a borehole on Antarctica, you have to drill quite far down. And that comes with all its, its problems. If you want to do some measurements near a, um, uh, uh, near a sort of a vent, a hydrothermal vent, or just the temperatures. The fact that you actually have to swim around in boiling water is, is going to stop a lot of people actually doing it. So there's a lot of stuff here on Earth that we actually don't know yet. We might have been to the moon, but uh, we were, went to the moon earlier than we actually went to the bottom of the Marianas Trench. It sort of tells you that uh, there's a lot of stuff still to find here on Earth and stuff might surprise us. Speaking of uh, possibly, you know, different uh, sources of looking for life, one of the things you mentioned was obviously the building blocks uh, of, of DNA and of, of RNA um, out there in, in the cosmos. You also mentioned, I believe um, it was uh, HCN, I think, yep. Yep. Um, as, as a possible alternative uh, basis for, for life. How likely do you think uh, that might be as a different uh, carbon-based life form? So, so the so the question is HCN is is an interesting molecule because as I say it's heavily poisonous and, and, and it's used as a essentially a poison for everybody else. Um, so it's really the, the question is the question of sequencing. So we tend to think in things of you go from small first and you go to big. So in other words, you start with amino acids and you form your uh, proteins or polymers uh, and then your proteins and and that's the way things form. That's called the RNA world hypothesis. But actually forming these peptide bonds is something which is really 
uh, energy intensive and you have to find a way around that and actually that's a problem that people haven't solved yet because we don't know how it happens going the other way going for hdn polymerization which is something that actually happens reasonably ready re re um, readily at, at rel relatively elevated temperatures to give you the backbone the polymer backbone and then build your uh, amino acids on top of that might be a lot more promising in that respect the problem really is that we don't know we don't have anything to compare to we we know the outcome and there are various ways of getting to the outcome but we don't really know what happens and we can't rerun really the experiment um we might be looking for stuff uh, you know one of the reasons why cassini was was uh, launched into saturn towards the end of its life is not to contaminate uh, europa or ganymede or anything like that with any potential life forms from earth um we know that uh, the outside of the ISS, there are bacteria that in principle could be there. They, 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 they will survive for some time. So it is a, definitely a possibility. PMA, uh, poly, I can't remember the acronym, but there's another polymer which has been uh, mooted as potential backbone for DNA, for example, as a precursor. Um, again, simple polymerization. It's much more rigid than DNA, much less functionalized, but it could be an intermediate step. Unfortunately, there's nothing that we can find. So with evolution, it's, it's interesting because you very often can actually look back, even in more complex organisms, you can see the machinery of more uh, or less developed uh, organism inside because essentially just essentially the new machinery is built around the old machinery effectively. But there's nothing, as far as I know, that actually goes back that far so that we can actually look at that and say, look, well, that's really an early remnant of, of how life developed. Sounds like it, it could be something, well, I guess in, in, in that respect, then we, we may discover life and not even realise that we have done. Um, so a bit of a food for thought. I just have uh, one last question from, from myself, and that was um, completely now going to a different topic. You mentioned the, uh, the possible dating of protostars using, I believe it was different sulphide uh, yep. or, or possibly sulphate uh, mm -hmm. molecules do you know if that has actually been conducively proven or is that still uh conjecture theory at the moment that that's a little bit of, that's that's a theory so um i know some groups uh, at ucl in particular have been working on that idea it really depends on some of the rates that you might have and and and, uh, and so on but they've they've used a number of systems it's not that widely accepted that that particular way of of of, me of uh uh, using uh, sulfur-based chemistry as a clock um, uh, is not been widely accepted yet, I don't think. So it's it's a conjecture, probably more than anything. On a wider scale, of course, the clock you know, from H2 all the way to urea or something like that, that definitely is a timeline, but it's not within a single species. So it's a little bit, little bit more tricky to, to pin it down in that case. Thank you. Thank you once again. Okay. I've just got a final question, if we're good for a time, Luke. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, I was just wondering, it, are there any profound impacts that, that extremely strong magnetic fields would have to the synthesis of molecules in space? For instance, we know that on Earth, molecules exist on the surface or in the atmosphere because we have, the, we have, we have shielding effect from the sun's ionizing radiation and so on but because of our magnetic fields and how would well, would things be different if it wasn't so yes yes uh, so um of course um hydromagnetic effects are, are quite uh, quite crucial in in the way so shocks for example are, are quite uh, important in, in destruction of molecules uh, your spectroscopy will change if you have a very strong magnetic field. Um, there is also a, a slightly more interesting uh, aspect to, to magnetic fields as well. So magnetic fields tend to orient uh, interstellar dust grains in a certain direction. And so you get light polarization. And that's something that can be detected. And the conjecture in that case, bring it back to the earlier topic we're talking about, that that might actually lead to uh, preferential destruction or formation of molecules with a certain handedness. Uh, so we know that life on Earth is, is homochiral, so we have L uh, amino acids and D sugars. Uh, there might be, there is a suggestion that actually that might be caused by the fact that you're dealing with polarized light 
uh, when form forming molecules, and therefore you get a slight enantiomeric excess uh, of things. Um, if you really if you really want to uh, do accurate spectroscopy, so for example, uh, if you want to measure the, the spectrum of, of water on the sun, then the magnetic field the, uh, the, of, of the sun really plays a very important role. The Zeeman effect in particular becomes very important there. And you have to include it, otherwise the, um, the measurements and the calculations don't really match up. I think that looks like that is going to wrap things up. So uh, I'd like to say on behalf of Astrosoc, uh, thank you once again uh, for both a, a really fascinating talk, but also for um, your, your brilliant answers to uh, a very enlightening uh, question and answer session. So thank you uh, from all of us here at Astrosoc at the University of Birmingham uh, once thank again. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. OK, thank you. I have ended the live stream. Hopefully that should